welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. New episode of All Things Policy. I'm Anu and I'm joined today by my colleagues Sridhar and Sudesha. All of us work together at Takshashila on the 20 million jobs project. And today we're really excited to discuss the 2023 budget and what it does to the jobs in India. Welcome to the podcast, you folks. Thanks, Anu. Hi, thank you. Awesome. Let's get stuck right in. So I'm really curious, even before we talk about the budget, I love how the budget turns everyone into an expert on finance and economics. So I am wondering if you folks had any thoughts on what should have happened or what were the experts saying on what should have happened this time in the budget as it, as it relates to jobs in India. So Disha, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so post-pandemic, most of the jobs, they can be characterized by how I see three things. One is underemployment, which means that Let's say if someone had an engineering degree, they are going and working in a call center. That to me is underemployment because their skills as an engineer are not being recognized. The second is lack of safety nets, which is highly prevalent through all the layoffs that are happening all across India. And the third is that a lot of the jobs are happening in the informal sector. So it's hard to track the conditions under which these workers are employed. There's a possibility that, let's say, an MSME got some credit boost through a government scheme and now they are able to pull in more resources and expanding their business and they are employing informal workers who are spending long hours. There's no way to track that, right? And the workers are desperate Mom. for money because they've suffered through all the lockdowns and all the other, the economic slowdown that happened during the pandemic. So that's how I would characterize the state of jobs in India post-pandemic. Here's what Dr. Pranab Sen says, who was the former chairman of the National Statistical Commission. He says that growth is being driven mostly by large corporates who have recovered from two years of COVID-19. But the micro, small and medium enterprises or the semi-formal sector is part dead and in part hasn't recovered from the double whammy of demonetization and the pandemic. And just to say it again, and we say that in every podcast, that the current state of unemployment is that it is at an all-time high, as reported by CMI in last December. Our unemployment rate was 8.3%. And it's important to note that urban unemployment is higher than rural unemployment, which shows that there's a serious problem. So according to me, my personal expectation was that MSMEs should get the governmental support that they need. And that could be in the form of credit boosts, that could be in the form of infrastructural push and um, maybe even easing compliance burden because MSMEs and businesses in general in India suffer through a lot of compliance cholesterol. And the second aspect that I really wanted to see in the budget was that social security schemes, especially Manrega, finally gets the budget allotment that it really needs. There has been a lot of revised estimates as to how much a scheme like Manrega needs. So first, it needs a proper budget allocation for this year, plus the spillover from all the previous years. And that's the revised estimate that should have been considered in this budget. Some of the schemes that I think should have made the cut was the emergency credit line guarantee scheme. This was started during the post-pandemic, you know, when it was that phase was very new. And the, the whole Atmanirbhis thing was being rolled out. But I still think that the scheme is still relevant, even at this point of time. We haven't really recovered yet. And we need an emergency credit line scheme for MSMEs. I actually was really looking forward to what's happening with the production-linked incentive scheme or the PLI scheme, as it's mostly called. And I think the last thing that I was looking forward to was which new industries um, have been incorporated to the ambit of the credit guarantee trust for micro and small enterprises scheme because a lot of industries have been demanding that they should be added to the ambit of the scheme because many MSMEs are able to benefit from this. Uh, so yeah, that was my expectation from the budget. I think that's very interesting, Sudisha. I think you've also, you mentioned a few things and I 
I mean, I understand that jobs are very important. And I think we're all working on that project because we believe that one of the biggest problems in India is uh, unemployment and lack of jobs. And yes, unemployment is at an all-time high. But a couple of things I want to point out. I mean, you said that the growth is, the Pranob Sain's point about how growth is being driven largely by large corporates and the MSME sector is, is not recovering from demonetization and the pandemic. I think one of the good things that have happened in our country is there's definitely an increase in formalization of jobs. While there is an increase in number of gig workers, etc. and all that, but the data seems to indicate that like, you know, there are more formal jobs today than there were in the past. So the trend is definitely not that way, especially through the GST regime, etc. and like many other things. There has been a, an increase and I think the EPFO data also sort of helps you see how this formal sector has grown. So that is true. The second thing that you talked about was that like, you know, the MSME sector is like, you know, highly affected and they are not being supported. Maybe when we discuss about some of the budget things, we can talk about it. But I, I also believe that jobs are created largely. I think we've kept all our firms small. I think in one of our earlier discussions, we've had that about how there hasn't been enough incentive for companies in India to really grow and become big. And uh, jobs are created, large number of jobs, especially for the unskilled sector, etc., is created when, by large enterprises, large organizations which can go out and hire people in great numbers. And that's also good for women. So when you look at large companies, typically those companies, women are more comfortable going to work in such spaces rather than in places which have like, which are very small, which have 40, 30, 40, 50 workers. I think like, you know, women find it a little less comfortable and and welcoming or uh, conducive to working there. So I think if we want more women at work and we want like, you know, more of our unskilled population to be able to get jobs, uh, large enterprises and large corporates are sort of required. But having said that, I think there's definitely a, an opportunity amongst the micro and the medium MSME sector. And we can discuss while at the next stage about what all is being done for that group yeah. and what's not. Yeah. yeah, so let's get stuck right in, I think. So I would like to see something much more on the scaling programs and I think how to finance scaling. I think like, you know, we will get to that too. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. And it's always good to share differing perspectives on what could have happened, but I would love to get stuck in on what did happen. And before we get into the meat of it, I think the most important question that everyone's curious about is how many times did she say jobs? So if our listeners remember, she then had a running back with us that our finance minister would say the word jobs more than 10 times in her budget speech. So we've spent our morning counting. And, and <laughs> what's the <laughs> word? Did she say it 10 times or do you owe us a treat? So she mentioned jobs eight times, right? And actually, Sudisha questioned that because... She said job in many cases and not jobs, but I think that's getting really technical. But she did mention job and, or jobs eight times in, in her budget speech. But if I want to like sort of cross the threshold of 10, then if I can include the three times that she used the word employment in her speech, then yeah, I think we would have crossed 10 and I would have to pay up. We let you go this time, Shita, but I think the, it made up all... <laughs> The reason we yeah. were doing this uh, fun little exercise was also because we wanted to assess how important jobs and skilling and the things that we talk about on this podcast and in our project are going to be in the budget. So let's get stuck right in, right? Uh, what I'd love for you yeah. guys to do is break it down and tell our listeners from a job perspective, employment and skilling perspective, what were the top features of the budget? Uh, does it do a good enough job against your expectations? And then we'll, we'll break down a few specific sectors that we're interested in, like green jobs, like sustainability, of course, and uh, cities and uh, MSMEs and things like that. But let's start with what does the budget actually do and is it good enough? Yeah, I think if I may go first on this one, I think, I mean, the reason we had that bet was because last time I went Nirmala Sitaraman presented her budget, she mentioned jobs only three times, right? But she had mentioned digital some 25, 30 times or so. So from that perspective, it seemed like the whole country was like looking for jobs. There were riots in various places, parts of the country about over jobs. But the budget didn't have much mention of jobs in the previous budget. However, I think like, you know, jobs definitely seems to have come front and center in the political discourse. And 
that is sort of indicated by the increased frequency of her use of the word jobs in her budget, right? So that's number one. So I'm happy that she has actually increased the number of times she mentioned. The second thing is that, you know, there's a lot of conversation. I think there is an acknowledgement of the fact that there's a huge skill mismatch in our country and a large number of our people need to be upskilled. Some of them are unskilled and some have to be skilled, but like many people who may have some skills today need to be upskilled. There is acknowledgement of the fact that technology is changing and this kind of upskilling will have to be done periodically. It's not just a one-time effort. So from that perspective, I think it's wonderful, right? So there is definitely a talk of that. There is mention for that. So I think that is good. Though I think uh, we can discuss about how they plan to make it happen, the fact that they're going to set up some 30 skill India centers and so on, and how that's going to actually work. And how has the, the National Skill Development Corporation been functioning? What kind of jobs have come out of it? How much has been spent on that over the years? What outcomes we have to show for it? I think some of that is what is a little opaque. And therefore, you wonder whether those skills will actually, the ambition of creating people who are much more skilled and have the relevant skills, whether that will become a reality, that's something that uh, we must uh, explore a little bit in greater detail. The second thing that I liked about it was the fact that, you know, there's a big capital investment outlay. There's a big increase in CapEx spending. That could lead to greater infrastructure spending, various other things. There's also more money allotted to the railways. I think there's some big 85,000 crore plus or something available for the railways. The railways themselves seem to be out on a big modernization mission. All that could lead to manufacturing jobs and, and more. So I think I'm a little bullish on that front, the fact that, you know, CapEx is being increased significantly. And uh, there's also a reduction in revenue spending and an increase in CapEx spending, which is good for our country. And I think it'll also lead to more jobs now. So I think in that respect, I'm quite pleased yeah, to the show. Yeah, I, so I think my opinion is that this is a business-friendly budget. There are uh, measures which have been told that they will be taken for ensuring that compliance burden is reduced. Businesses get the credit they need. Businesses get the infrastructural support that they need, the energy support that they need. And I think overall, let's imagine this utopian scenario that whatever has been allotted, it, everything is spent the way it's supposed to, right? Then I would say that, yes, we can expect good growth for businesses, which inadvertently will lead to job creation. Uh, the one part that worries me is the social welfare bit. And uh, according to the news reports that I had been reading, around 1 lakh crore should have been allotted to Manrega. This was the revised estimate, which took into account the spillover that has been happening for all these years, plus the wages and the administrative expenditure that was required for this year. Unfortunately, the budget has been reduced by 25%, which is a little shocking to me because I think this is the most important scheme in India right now. Yes, MSMEs and their growth is also important, but we really need to make sure that we guarantee the right to work to these people. So that part has been a little worried. I have been reading some op-eds on the same that the government should have poured some more money into the Mandrega scheme. But on the same... Sorry, uh, Sudisha, just to get here. I mean, we'll be talking about jobs. Can you tell me how a lower allocation for Mandrega leads to sort of less jobs? It'd be helpful for people to sort of understand. Yeah, that's a good question. So the problem is that I think one needs to view it uh, with the sense of profit and loss, right? You already have financial backlog because you're not able to pay off the wages to the administrative staff and to the workers, right? Based on that, even if there is demand, how will you get more people to work? Even people will be de-incentivized from working. So according to me, I think not allotting proper amount of budget to Manrega will deter workers from applying to the scheme and based oh. on that they don't really have anywhere else to gravitate to right Manrega no, was I mean, they'll the jobs if they get something else 
but I think that they will apply for one rega is supposed to be like you know employment at, of last resort, right? It's not about a, the situation where people's first choice is to go and do one rega. It should be to get like a regular job for which they need skills, and then there should be more jobs in the country, which will like and Mandrega's one of Mandrega's objectives was to say that we want to lower the demand for Mandrega, right? So people shouldn't want Mandrega jobs, and that's the way this sort of government is sort of looking at it also. Yeah, I think, but there yeah, are six, budget for it. So, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what my point is. That this should be done when we have the confidence that we have enough jobs for those people to absorb. We do not. So I think, according to me, I think we need to pour money into Manrega right now, alongside creating an ecosystem where more jobs can be present for those workers to absorb. But right now, neither is happening. So for uh, me, that thing is missing. Well, being done. Okay. Yeah, I agree that like you know, there are really poor people in our country. There are people for whom I mean, there's like there's a lot of poverty in our country, and Manrega definitely. Provided some level of succor to that group, and reducing the amount of money being sort of given to them is going to be challenging. But at the same time, I think if you take all the money that's available or is being is considered available for something like this, I mean, choosing to sort of deploy some of it into skilling programs, investing more into capital outlays, etc., and some money, more money being allotted for. MSME credit and all that, all that will also lead to jobs and reduce the demand for it from another direction. So I'm not saying that like today, Manrega sixty three thousand crores or whatever is adequate, but I think like you know the money is being it's not being spent on something less important. It's also being spent whatever money is not being spent on Manrega is now being spent on things which are sort of. That's yeah, important. let's let's That's... talk about that. I think an uh, interesting point that you brought up, Shridhar, is the fact that maybe this money is being used on capex, right, or skills, which we've spoken about often, is that there is yeah. a gap, right, in the market. Even if to Sudesha's point, uh, jobs are available to these folks who would ordinarily avail Mandrika. The question I have is the skilling initiatives that have been given more money or have been introduced by this budget, are they adequate? And do they do a good enough job of matching market-needed skills with the people who need to acquire these skills? And I know you've done a little bit of work on that. So what's your take on the money that's been poured into skilling? Because that's been definitely one of the bigger outcomes of this budget. Yeah, I think the money which is going into skilling, first thing I'm happy that like, you know, they're going to launch some Skill India digital platform. They will tell you link employers. They talk about what is the types of skills, jobs that are required. They sort of connect people who employers and employees. Then they want to also have, uh, they want to provide formal skilling programs based on the demand, which is there for a particular skill. There's some Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana. There are some 30 Skill India International Centers that will be set up. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has talked a lot about how India can become the skills capital of the world and be providing skilled people to work in many other parts of the world as well. So I think like, you know, in terms of ambition, I think it's very good. And I think it's in line with what India is capable of going and achieving. But in terms of the fact that if I can't for the life of me imagine how a bunch of People sitting in government can understand what skills are required in India and like just be able to like create do a top down approach on that and tell people, okay, here are these 14 skills that you should go and acquire and all that. So I think from that perspective, the outcomes of our skilling programs are going to be suspect. And I also would have liked to see a number which says, you know, we have invested X amount of money on our skill development corporation and our skilling programs in the last one year. And these are the number of jobs that were created as a result. And these are the average wage or the range of money incomes that these people who've got jobs have got. You know, if, I, if you had that level of transparency in terms of money spent and outcomes achieved, then you know that this is a serious program. Otherwise, sometimes you think like many of these have lofty ambitions, but like a wise man once told me, ambition is not an input. On that yeah. note, I think we're going to go take a break and then come back and discuss the other areas in this budget that seem to have lofty ambitions and we hope we'll be tracing. 
we'll be right back. All right, and we're back. I think before we left for the break, we were talking about skilling and how while the intentions are great, there's reason to suspect implementation and how good those outcomes are going to be. Uh, what struck me with this budget was also a lot of areas that we talk about as big bets at this project. We've spoken about tourism. We've spoken about green jobs and sustainability. We've spoken about MSMEs, of course, have actually featured heavily in this budget, right? Uh, the Deku Apna Desh program, there's going to be more money allocated to it to promote domestic tourism, which I thought was great. So I'd love to get your views on what are the big bets that the government has made in respect to jobs in this budget? Uh, and what's the next frontier, so as to say? Maybe if you want to break down sustainability or tourism or one of these aspects for us. Let's start with you, Sudesha. Yeah, so uh, I think my assessment is strictly from the lens of the ideas that we've been working on. So we work a little bit on the tourism idea. So the Kwapta Desh initiative is to encourage people to travel domestically instead of internationally. There's a lack of transparency as to how this initiative will be carried out. Again, the problem, if, if they say that they're going to upskill people in this area. So I'm actually reminded of a great example that I came across when I was a student in Takshashila and I remember Sarthak brought this example, which was that there is a village, right? And there is a skill program for girls and they are being taught to stitch. Now, everyone knows how to do stitching. So what happens after that? Where is the demand for the work? So I think that is my issue with a lot of the skill programs that they talk about. So for example, upskilling of artisans in India in areas of digital payments, business deals, that's great. But I think what they really need is a budgetary boost addition instead of skill updation. Because even if they have the skills, they can't really go out and kickstart their, their whole business, right? So... This actually takes me back to the point that Sridhar made that what are the skills that you're going to impart these people? Let's say that you set up a skill center where you are teaching people graphic designing. But how do they market the graphic designing skill that they are obtaining? So we don't have any clarity on that. I'm actually looking forward to seeing uh, what happens in that area. One thing which I feel positive about is that the budget states that in the next three years, center will recruit 38,800 teachers and support staff for the 740 Iklave model residential schools. This is a direct job opportunity. So that's something I'm definitely looking forward to. In areas of sustainability, there is a scheme called MISHTI, which is Mangrove Initiative for Shoreline Habitats and Tangible Incomes. So having worked on a thesis on coastal zone regulation in India, I honestly feel like this is a little counterproductive. Because if you look at the CRZ violations that are happening all across the country, the Bombay High Court on December 9, 2022 granted permission to cut close to 22,000 mangrove trees in Mumbai, Thane and Palgal for the upcoming bullet train from Mumbai to Ahmedabad. So you have this happening on one hand, but on the other hand, you're introducing a scheme for mangrove plantation. For me, that's a little counterproductive and I can't really see the job opportunity here, so to say. There is another scheme that really caught my eye, which was Green Credit Program. It's hard to gauge exactly what the scheme means right now, because there are a couple of climate credit companies in India, which Google, for example, has done this, right? That they are doing one thing, which is climate conscious. So they are getting climate credit, so to say. So there are companies that their credit here doesn't really meet financial boost. It can also mean the points that you get credited when you do something which is in favor of the environment. So I, for me, it's a little hard to gauge what this green credit program really means. Does it mean that eco-friendly companies will get credit? Or does it mean that companies will be incentivized to follow environmentally conscious practices and then they will get some credit points? So I am not really sure what that means. One thing that I am excited about under sustainability is the this interstate transmission system for evacuation and grid integration of 13 gigawatt renewable energy from Ladakh. I think this will be a welcome opportunity as we gravitate towards the 2070 mission funded net zero. And uh, I think this is an area where we can see that there will be a direct job opportunity as well. So I'm excited to see that. I'm also excited for the National Green Hydrogen Mission. 
I think that there was a, actually a press release by the government which stated that 6 lakh jobs can be created through this mission. So I think this mission has capacity to do that eventually. And uh, the budget allegation is pretty great. Uh, I think around 8 lakh crore have been invested in this, have been told to invest in this scheme. So I do look forward to that. The great aspect about this budget was the ease of doing business bit and the access to credit MSMEs. Lots of positives that I saw. One was that there will be a unification of a portal which which carries out all the compliance filing that these businesses have to run post to pillar for. So I think something like Udyam, for example, has already been implemented. So I'm excited to see over that what they are going to implement for unification of compliance filing, etc. So that's something I'm looking forward to. Around 10,000 crore rupees have been allotted to the Urban Infrastructure Development Fund, which is again very important for businesses. Same with all the allocations that have been done to railways, for example, or highways, for example. So I think good amount of money is allocated to these infrastructure developments, which I think are incredibly important for carrying out trade. So uh, I'm excited to see what the government does with this budget allocation. And then there are small things for MSMEs, which I think even though they are small changes, I think the impact that these things will have will be great. So for example, an entity DigiLocker will be set up for use by MSMEs, large businesses and charitable trusts. This will be used towards storing and sharing documents online securely, which I think is a need of the art. So digitization of the documentation processes that MSMEs have to run around for, I think that's very important. And I think the last bit that caught my eye was the Teen Dayal Antyodhya Yochna National Rural Livelihoods Mission. My problem with this scheme is that it's trying to achieve way too many things. It's trying to upskill people. It's trying to fund them for creating houses. It's also trying to provide credit for micro enterprises. I think individual schemes for these things exist. And I think that uh, there can be an overlap with this scheme and those, for example, the credit guarantee scheme, or um, I'm sure there's a scheme for house construction also. So yeah, that, that, that's that been my assessment, things that have caught my eye, which I think will be important for job creation as well. Yeah, that's quite comprehensive, uh, Sudisha. So I had a couple of things to sort of add and maybe sort of comment on some things that you had said. One was around, uh, I think in terms of MSME, I think you had earlier mentioned that you were not very happy with like, you know, the amount of work being, being done for the MSME. But I think essentially there is some, there is a lot of work being done towards providing credit for the MSME sector. And acknowledging that the biggest problem that the MSME sector seems to be facing today is uh, poor credit. And I think they're forming, they, they say that they sh it should lead to additional 2 lakh crores or something being available for uh, the MSME sector to borrow from. I think that's a good situation. I think like, you know, I, I'm not sure if that's adequate though, because the need, MSME sector in India has only about 15 to 20% of its credit needs. And there isn't enough being done to ensure that the MSME sector gets paid on time. There is um, a government diktat saying that, yes, you should pay. They went all out and told the private sector that, like, you know, if you don't pay the MSMEs on time, then, like, you know, we will penalize you. But uh, the biggest debtor to the MSME sector is really the state and central governments and, those and the public sector enterprises. And they are notoriously bad at paying on time. And I think like, that's something that needed to be addressed with greater seriousness. I'm not seeing that. But I do see a whole lot of work being done, like Sudisha mentioned, in terms of improving ease of doing business and building some new critically required transport infrastructure projects and uh, improving the supply chain, making supply chain easier, more efficient within the country by making movement of goods and services better. I think there's that. But I think the biggest one is around, like, you know, clearly the government has decided that we will increase capital expenditure by like, you know, 30 odd percent and uh, go up to 10 lakh crores in money being spent on CapEx. So I think that's going to definitely be a, a good thing. I also had some point around, I think the railways are modernizing at a 
furious space. I think providing 88,000 crores to the railways, which is the highest that they've got in terms of capex, 2.4 lakh crores or whatever was available for the railways. But I think 88,000 crores is like, you know, a big a capex requirement for them, which is being given. Then I think that's a big one. So I think if these things, if the, if the money gets invested in the right things, the right type of capital expenses, which will lead to like jobs, I know that the construction sector is a, has very high employment elasticity. So these should lead to increased jobs. And I, I would like some more transparency around numbers in terms of like, you know, everybody just chooses to look at the numbers that they like, which, and instead we should have like a, we have, have some a correct way of looking at jobs and um, know that uh, you, you can't make claims like, you know, we've been adding a million jobs each month. Somebody from government said recently that we've been adding a million jobs each month. And I don't think that's really, it's hard to sort of believe some numbers like that. And uh, especially at a time when we are seeing unemployment as the highest ever, I find some things like this a little hard. There's some We need to build more credibility to our numbers. And uh, But otherwise, I think uh, directionally at least, and conceptually and directionally, I think this is a good budget. I would have liked uh, the government not to be focusing on building uh, skilling centers and having a skill development corporation, etc. Instead, they need to have like money being... We've been talking about what is called career impact bonds where uh, at-risk loans are given to people who need some new training and who need to upskill themselves and to align incentives between those who provide the skills, the people who seek the skills and the investors by ensuring that this, uh, these at-risk loans then get securitized, then people who are um, financial invest in the, in the, more, in the less risky tra- senior tranches and the government could be using the money that it is proposing to spend on skill development, etc., in subscribing to the equity tranches, which are more risky, right? So that way you're ensuring that money is being spent towards providing skills, but you're not presuming that as the government, you know what skills are required how they should be taught. What is it? It's much better to leave that to the market. The market knows best in terms of what skills are required. The market will tell you what kind of jobs, what kind of, which training center trains people well and is able to get them employed. And therefore, if financial markets monitor this, then they can direct money towards their best, better performing training schools. And therefore, we could keep this in a more sustainable manner. So I, I really wish that we get out of this mindset of, you know, we know best about what to teach and what people should learn and leave that to the market and focus on providing some kind of uh, risk financing for training. I think that's what I would like the government to be doing. But at least I think they are talking about jobs. I'm very happy and I'm happy that they're talking about skills, which is very important. Yes, and we talked about green growth in our previous um, one of our earlier episodes, we talked about how India has this big ambition to grow. We need to grow by 7 to 10% plus per annum over the next 20, 30 years in order to achieve our goals of becoming a developed nation by the time India gets to 100. And for that, but then we also need to go green because we have made zero emission, I mean, net zero commitments and all that. So, which does mean that India can create jobs in the green area. The government is sort of saying, yes, let's do it. And there's an opportunity, but... You know, we have to, there's a knowing doing gap, right? So it's one thing to know that this is an opportunity and quite another to do all the things which are necessary to make it a reality. So I think the jury's out to, we'll find out. On that note, I think couldn't have said it better, we'll find out. I think our assessment seems to be some hits, some misses. Happy to see green growth be one of the subterishies, I believe they're calling it, killing good yeah. focus for we we're not sure if we agree with the methods of implementation, MSMEs. Yay for MSMEs is what I will say. Uh, it's good to see credit being given where credit is due. And yeah, it looks like while we don't agree necessarily with everything that has been done, it could be a good budget for jobs. And at the very least, we're happy that she said it more times than, than she said it yep. last time. At the very least. On that yeah, note... At least I don't have to pay up, yeah. At least Sheeta doesn't have to pay up. <laughs> All right. On that note, thank you for tuning in and we will catch you next time. Thank you. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. 
You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in.